So hi everyone, uh, I'm Pavel and uh, in the next 30 minutes we'll be talking a lot about architecture but not about buildings but rather uh, mobile development and uh, mm, Kotlin, Kotlin multi-platform. Multi so uh, what's uh, important on uh, Kotlin, uh, it allows us to actually be more efficient to write less code and at the same time uh, to target both platforms. So um, yeah, and it's very, very uh, right time to, to uh, start using that as a new version. If you haven't done so, the, the new version has been released this, this month and the JetBrains, the company uh, behind uh, Kotlin Multiplatform promised to have a final release at, uh, at the end of the year. So it's uh, fascinating times. And there is a lot of projects starting right now, so it's probably right time. And if you look here into uh, libraries, there are plenty of them which uh, deal with a sort of various problems uh, in cross-platform way. There are not that many uh, of, of them uh, dealing with uh, uh, UI. And maybe the, the reason for that is that uh, actually the, the, the cross-platform UI development is kind of difficult. Uh, some people uh, do have knowledge on one platform, which uh, transfer poorly to the other one, and their application can kind of eventually look weird, strange. Uh, another problem which I, I noticed, uh, there might be uh, libraries, I don't want to name them, but there is a library which only deals with uh, navigation in a cross-platform uh, uh, way. So you have to plug your UI and to get from, from screen a to screen B, you have to write something like three classes, well, well which to me uh, is kind of like uh, controversial to, to, the, uh, to the goal of uh, writing less code. And another interesting aspect is that uh, there is kind of like a lack of uh, a common uh, architecture, which is not that surprising because each of, of those platforms has its own set of problems. And uh, let me quickly look into one of uh, such problems we, we have. Uh, well, I go back all the way to the Android release 2008, if you remember that cool device. I still have it somewhere in my drawer. Uh, one of the features, flagship features of Android was uh, XML-based layout, and they promised this is like an easy way how to construct UI. Uh, I, I never really like it, and uh, basically this is how I get into uh, I picked my, my interest uh, or started my interest into, into architecture and how to design uh, user interfaces. And if you run to me at some conference at the time, you can get a T-shirt with uh, that particular motif on it. And uh, to a little surprise, when uh, user interface or technology got more complex with interaction with Honeycomb and tablets, and the whole system, the whole design decision blew up uh, and uh, it didn't work on, on the complex screen as you cannot really uh, include XML files to each other. And Android uh, engineers came with a rather interesting uh, decision to bring fragments, uh, technology you all know well, which is kind of puzzling to me if you see the uh, keywords in red. I don't really know why there are transactions, but let it and uh, this uh, technology was sort of uh, uh, deprecated, but it's still present. Uh, Jetpack Compose uh, is fully able to compose actually more multiple views at the same time on the, on the tablet screen, but that complexity of fragment is still with us. So that might be a, a one of the reasons why uh, making really like a clean architecture which will work on both platforms is difficult. Situation on iOS, uh, I, well, we are on the Android conference. I don't want to deal into the details, but uh, there is a lot of legacy problems coming from the Objective-C, etc. cetera. So, uh, well, the situation is not uh, that great. And this is like awesome opportunity for, for new ideas. So I feel that it's really like a great time uh, to, to come with a, with a new, uh, new perspective. Uh, with uh, uh, architecture and cross-platform development. 
And uh, uh, what I propose is something which I usually uh, call like model driven architecture. I'll quickly go to what I mean by that. You have some model object, uh, the class or struct, which uh, defines your, your domain model. And out of that, you get a representation. So uh, for example, you can have your, I don't know, uh, invoice, whatever. And you can have uh, some library provide you with a complete a database layer with all the abstraction. But we won't talk about databases today. We'll be more focusing on the user interface. So I'll give you a concrete example. There is simple Kotlin uh, data class, uh, very basic. There is just one property and one function. Uh, we add a couple of uh, annotations to that. Uh, like uh, we uh, let the system know how we want that property to be presented. And we also uh, add annotation to that function that we want to actually make it uh, a callable thing, which will be represented by the button. And uh, the system will provide us with some sort of interface out of that. It's really like a canonical example. Uh, forgive me that this is actually on iOS, but hopefully you can translate it to Android. And uh, by pressing that greet me button, uh, the text will get uh, updated into the field. So uh, the first important takeaway uh, for that approach, uh, we try to save time and write less code by generating as much as possible and still have it uh, available for further customization. Uh, that idea is not new, actually. I would like to credit the guy who came with, with his solution like a while ago. And when I tried to first uh, uh, adapt it to Android, I used uh, Reflection API, which had some sort of performance problems and also had some, some difficulties uh, to reach certain features. The next attempt was, was better. I was using TAPT, the uh, annotation processing. Uh, but uh, I obviously wanted to, to have solution cross-platform, so uh, I let it uh, be for, for a while and basically waited for the right opportunity, which means uh, I waited for Kotlin multi-platform to get more mature, which is now. Uh, I had to change uh, some of uh, the technology stack because KAPT is uh, tied to the Java virtual machine. So I had to use a different system. Don't know if you're familiar with Kotlin symbol processing. It's an interesting beast. Uh, very quick overview. What you have to do is basically three steps. You have to define your own symbol processor, uh, provide it uh, with an environment which gives you access uh, to the code generator, which will allow you to generate your, your actual code uh, for, for your classes, and also gives you access to the logger, which uh, will allow you to, to emit warnings if something is not right, or even errors, which will stop the compilation. So that's a handy way how to uh, check for whatever structural problems in your code and ensure that everything is totally safe, especially type safe. So I found uh, dealing with uh, KSP a bit uh, complicated, especially uh, in regards of uh, Kotlin multi-platform. I struggled with that a bit for, for a while. So I created an article. There is a link for you. And there, in that article, there is also a link to a sample uh, project. So feel free to take it as a starting point if you want to do experiments on, on your own. So now uh, we have uh, our uh, technology stack and what we can do with that. So uh, I would like to uh, show you how to get to some uh, new levels of uh, effectivity and how to write less code. And for that, I would like to introduce the new architecture, uh, which I called model view controller, uh, get uh, to that uh, very quickly, uh, we have the model part, which is defined in Kotlin multi-platform and actually provides, and this is our business logic and then defines the functionality of our application. And it's like a, like a dominant part of the application. And then we have a view controller part, which is uh, uh, initially generated by KSP for us, but uh, it still can be customized. That's why it's in bracket. It's there, but you don't have to use it if you're happy with, uh, with the default uh, implementation. And I created uh, a simple implementation, uh, which I called objects forms. Uh, and uh, all the examples I'll show later in this talk uh, are uh, based on that. 
Uh, and perhaps you ask why we need a new architecture pattern. Uh, when I thought about that, I, I came to like a, a bottom line for me is that uh, the components which are used for, for common uh, mobile UI um, libraries are great. You can, you can, yeah, they are very flexible. You can uh, create whatever you want, but they, uh, to some extent, they provide a wrong level of abstraction. So what I mean by that, uh, well, I, I mentioned that I would like to generate code, and this is difficult. And also, uh, they require a lot of a lot of work. Uh, I'll like, quickly give you an uh, example of what I mean by that. Uh, so uh, let's um, expect that we want to write um, a, a form which uh, has a uh, text field which uh, allows us to input only the uh, integer value. So we have a, we'll use a text field for that, but the, and the type will be different. It will be integer in that way. But text field is backed uh, on both platforms by, by string. So you, we have to use the on value change function to actually do, do the conversion. It's simple, but still you have to provide that conversion and you have to deal with uh, possible exceptions, stuff like that. Also, you might uh, need to provide a visual transformation function if you are not happy with uh, cases where there might be like a double uh, decimal dots or stuff like that. And also, you want to provide a correct keyboard, just just uh, uh, numbers, no, no letters. So you also have to set up that. It's slightly uh, easier on iOS because uh, their binding is uh, based on format input uh, and their default implementation for all types, including integer, but you still have to deal with the keyboard and uh, and uh, stuff you do on submit, you have to uh, convert it into, into the correct value. So uh, that's kind of a lot of work and let's get uh, into more aspects of uh, the components of uh, Jetpack Compose or Swift UI. There is a single frame, like a single rectangle, which you can use for layout in your more complex screen. Uh, but uh, inside, there is just a single view. There, there, there are no extra functionalities, uh, text view and nothing else. Uh, uh, there is, uh, you have to provide your own value binding. I already mentioned that. And there is no architecture with, which would enforce that pattern. So uh, you, there are many ways how you can do it, do it wrong. And I've seen people having difficulties with uh, simple stuff like value binding. Uh, you have to do uh, further customization. I mentioned the keyboard, other stuff. And all sum up, this is a lot of coding for simple stuff like a, a text input for integer. So uh, there might be better way how to do that. And uh, this is the important part of the architecture I'm talking about, and I call that smart components. So they are different level of components. And a uh, key aspect for me is there are two functions which are part of the interface which defines them uh, as a setter getter, uh, pretty basic. But uh, that means that uh, those components are both value and type agnostic. Uh, Maybe you notice that there is no type specified, but I'll get to that later. And uh, the functionality of, of those components is driven by annotation. So you define by annotation what, what uh, the component should do. Uh, again, a quick summary of what that means for the component. Uh, there is the same frame, uh, same uh, rectangle, which you have to place on the screen. But in this case, because there is more functionality and it's part of a bigger piece, uh, the, the, the model which drives it, or implementation of the model which drives this on the client. The navigation is built in, so you don't have to do anything uh, and the navigation uh, works correctly. Uh, that a component consists of multiple views, so you have some, some uh, functionality for, for free, like a drill down, so if you have to show um, uh, details of a complex type, you can. Uh, there is a built-in collapsing or validation. Uh, there is also value binding provided by you by those methods I already shown, and they are enforced by the architecture. So you always you are sure that you uh, uh, use them right, and you have uh, those options provided by you, but you can tweak them if if you want. But again, you save some work, and everything is generated for you. So 
yeah, it's more more efficient. Um, to get it all working, the, this is the, the KSP uh, generates uh, adapters for, for the model. What I mean by that, I'll look at this example I provided uh, before. And uh, KSP at the, at the compile time uh, creates this uh, adapter class. There is a bunch of uh, um, pre preprocessed uh, properties. There are a list of those callables, which can be turned into the UI buttons. There is also lifecycle callables uh, on opening of the screen, on closing of the screen. And there is uh, one a function on the button. Let me uh, zoom in. Uh, it's a method which is used to, to uh, keep uh, the UI representation in sync uh, from the model. It can be called automatically or at, at your will. Uh, and uh, it's kind of suspicious code because, uh, well, there is weird cast without, well, should, should that be always uh, of that type, uh, then you uh, access it by, by a string. So it looks like a code which might eventually fail. But it's not the case because this this is a generated code, and it's uh, called by the system, and it's guaranteed that it's type safe. It's always called with the correct parameters, so it cannot really fail. And uh, if you think about that, it gives uh, a type safe static language uh, very dynamic features, which are typical for languages like JavaScript or TypeScript, and they are enforced at the uh, compile time. So this actually gives you both of the best uh, best of the both words. So there are some bonuses coming for for free if you use this architecture and those components. I mentioned that navigation is provided for free and works on both platforms. You just don't have to deal with that. It works. So if you want to do drill down, it just works. Uh, then uh, you get uh, free bonuses like a validation with uh, special API. Uh, again, quick example. This is something like a settings with a bunch of properties, and uh, again one function which calls validation on on that on the data class. Uh, have a quick zoom look at two of those properties. It's some sort of username which is handy if it's not empty, and then there is email which is also. Nice if a uh, user provides it to, to us and it's actually a valid email or at least formally valid. So if, if we uh, add those three annotations to those properties, we get um, UI, which if we click on the validate button down there, uh, will uh, show us those two red triangles. And if you click on one of them, you see the reasons why for that, that email is not is empty. So it needs to be uh, filled with something and also because it's empty, it's not a valid email. So uh, it's a free validation with a very simple uh, and elegant uh, API provided basically for free. And I mentioned that the part of that architecture is a view controller, which is also generated for you. And by generating, I mean uh, there is a, a custom DSL provided per each model. So it's uh, uh, distinct uh, language for each of your models and um, how that look like. Again, we have that model which defines our, our business logic. And this one is in the shared code. On the client, there is something which corresponds to the controller and the view. So that, that uh, con uh, the, the actual client UI consists of those two representations. And uh, model can uh, communicate with them, so it can update the state back and forth. And uh, at the same time, they, they are on that shared code side, uh, two uh, language sets defined, one, one for controller, one for view. And they can communicate uh, with those runtime representations. And at the same time, they can be hooked to the model. So that's that's uh, basically how the architecture works. And you have a very uh, rich uh, tools uh, to, to work. And the beauty of that is that uh, the DSL is constructed at properties of of uh, that uh, of that uh, class are actually keywords in that in that language. So it's very easy uh, to to work with them. 
Uh, that group here means that uh, phone and email will be put on the same line. If there is space for that, and also the order is changed. So and that, that there will be other uh, other uh, possible modifications, but we don't have time to to go into much details. I would like to present another domain uh, specific language, which is uh, to describe the content. So there is a concept of scenes. So each scene can consist of many objects, which are uh, uh, which are instantiated there. So there is one intro. Uh, object at the beginning, and then there is another uh, scene consisting of two objects, which will be represented in in a top view. So you get the top view for for free on both platforms just by the fact that you put two objects next to each other. So uh, by that you define how your application should look like in really like a dedicated language, and benefit of that is on the client. This is uh, iOS, and that's. Uh, that's Android. You only provide one single line. That object form dot create scenes is all you have to do on the client, and everything is uh, done cross platform. So it's super efficient way how to how to deal uh, with with uh, application development. Uh, important aspect: uh, all is native code. Uh, use Swift UI uh, on on iOS. Uh, views on on uh, Android. And uh, it uh, can be intertwined with, with stuff. If you want to do anything custom, you can call uh, just your custom use. You can modify whatever you can. Yeah, it's it's all all your your code. It's very easy to to extend. So if you are not happy with with custom behavior, you can you can keep keep working on that. It's all native. And uh, if you are not happy with uh, default custom. Uh, the default components which are provided, you can provide your custom uh, variants using this annotation. So it's all under full control of the developer. So this is a quick summary of uh, uh, features of other uh, cross-platform frameworks, like uh, one provided by Meta, the uh, React Native, which, well, is not native, Flutter, uh, Jetpack uh, multi-platform and, and uh, my uh, MVC implementation. Uh, note that uh, architecture is not really set anywhere except of MVC. And uh, UI components used to uh, to define them are, are also varied. Uh, dark, uh, the, uh, Flutter draws everything to the to the canvas, which is which can be. Difficult if uh, the, there is a new version of the operating system, and uh, this uh, approach is also the only one which uses Swift UI on the on the iOS. So it can actually run, unlike uh, uh, Jetpack multi-platform, it can run on the Watch OS, Apple Watch. Uh, just a quick summary of features. Uh, you get a lot of stuff for free. I mentioned navigation, uh, validation, those uh, domain-specific languages. And all of them are declarative, but uh, only this one uh, gets stuff generated for you. So only this solution actually helps you to uh, save some time. So uh, as uh, I mentioned at the beginning, um, Kotlin multi-platform is set to be released this year. I, I also target uh, public release of my of my library uh, this year, at least at, at some like early beta form. So this is the link to to the website I have. So uh, if you're interested, uh, either keep eye on on that on the web page where there will be more details coming hopefully soon, and uh, or get in touch. I'll be I'll be happy to provide you with more details. So. This is this is all all from me and uh, um, yeah this is uh, my my contact address so feel free to, to reach me I'll be happy to discuss it in more details with, with you and uh, yeah that that's it for me and I, I guess we have still some time for for questions yeah let's give it um so we have touch over five minutes until the next talk starts so. Folks, we'll give you about two minutes or so to um, write some questions in the YouTube comments section. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just chat with Pavel. So uh, yeah, thank you for the presentation, Pavel.
I uh, I like that. I'm I am curious about the preference for um MVC or MVVM versus one like any of the others. I feel like this is a topic that just kind of never ends, and reasonably so. It's you know it's it it really it depends on how you implement it. Um, which one, like, you know, whichever way I feel like um, you go with, as long as it's implemented in a maintainable way and I guess a well, well built tends to just be fine. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. I, I never said uh, there is anything wrong on, uh, on any of those uh, patterns. If, if you find with them, uh, well, you have definitely freedom to, to do whatever you want and you're fle flexible. I, I just uh, feel that there are there are some uh, constraints because nothing is really uh, enforced on each of those platforms. So uh, that makes uh, the cross-platform development especially difficult because there is no really like nothing set in stone. So you can't can't use something like a common uh, minimum uh, denominator. So this is uh, this is a proposal how you can actually like take, take advantage of that. So it's mm -hmm. nothing mm -hmm. you you really have to follow, but can give you uh, a head start in cases where you know you want to, to make something fast. You want to be effective. That this is a good good foundation for the application. Mm. And I also uh, mentioned that in the talk, uh, there is also always access for you to all of those structures. So if you want to extend it or you want to mix it with whatever else, you're free to go. So, so yeah. it's not like a silver bullet. I have uh, uh, seen those uh, solutions based on um, like JavaScript in the, in the past where the uh, API or, or getting from, from that uh, uh, non-native code to writing something native was difficult. And uh, you can write 80% fairly fast, and then those 20% uh, percent turn to be next to the impossible because that, that interface was so complicated. I, I wrote a couple of those applications myself or what was part of the team writing those. And you can easily see the difference between non-native and native. This is all native. So yeah, you are not forced to, to, to use anything, but yeah, it's, it's, an, it's another option. I, I see it as another uh, weapon in your in your arsenal. Mm, mm. And thank you for responding. Uh, th thank you for insight uh, for, for an honest response. I think what you're saying makes sense. And yeah, um, we do see one question um, from Simon Top, who also said hello to me. So hi, Simon. <laughs> um, and I'll leave it for you to uh, answer, Pablo. Yeah, I repeat a really interesting talk and what is your option on compose multi-platform or in place of using views or use compose uh well i kind of like uh, compose multi-platform uh, uh, it might be it might still need some time to mature uh i see uh it has uh Advantages, disadvantages. Uh, it's the, those uh, components I mentioned uh, still suffer, in my in my opinion, uh, from the same problem I mentioned in the talk. Like uh, their uh, abstraction level is not correct, or is not not correct is not the, the, the good word, but they they are not appropriate. And as a result of that, uh, you have to write a lot of stuff to to actually uh, cry, create your your UI using those those components. So it's okay. It's okay if you need something very specific, like if if you if you uh, need to uh, to deal with a lot of like custom and, and intertween uh, intertween functionality. Uh, but uh, if if you don't, um, maybe there is faster and more efficient way how to how to deal with that. So there is nothing wrong with Compose multi-platform. And uh, concerning uh, the other question. Uh, uh, yeah, I use views not because I don't like Compose, or Jetpack Compose, but I, I already had implementation on Android uh, using views. And uh, well, the technology is still uh, beneath that, so there is no uh, performance penalty. I might eventually rewrite it in uh, uh, Jetpack Compose. I use uh, Swift UI on, on iOS side because I had nothing there. 
and I wanted to use the latest and all, I also wanted uh, stuff which would eventually run everywhere where the only Swift UI is available. And that's also one of the drawbacks of the Compose multi-platform because uh, uh, it, uh, the, the components which are used on iOS are based on the UI kit. So it won't run on, on Apple Watch, for example, because uh, Kotlin multi-platform currently doesn't have uh, a Swift uh, API. Uh, there is only Objective-C, so it has to use uh, UI kit. Uh, I have a different binding uh, and uh, I create stuff uh, on the client so I can and use uh, Swift UI. So that's advantage of, of my approach. You can use the latest technology, uh, unlike Compost Multi-Platform. So hopefully that answers the question. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, just in time uh, for Pamela's talk to start. Thank you so much, Pavel. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me.